Bonjour tout le monde. Nous avons l'honneur de, de vous présenter aujourd'hui euh, le, 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 un debriefing sur tout ce qu'on a fait hier euh, sur euh, les AMP. Donc euh, les AMP en étant un espace euh, délimité en mer euh, pour, un, pour objectif de protection euh, euh, pour objectif de protection et de, euh, et de développement durable d'activités économiques de pêche, euh, de pêche durable et de tourisme euh, euh, responsable. Nous avons parlé euh, de, de, de l'importance de, de ces AMP pour l'utilisation durable des ressources et de biodiversité. Donc, euh, nous avons vu hier l'architecture d'un système intégré euh, des AMP qui se décompose, euh, que que se décompose en trois composantes. La, la composante euh, de conservation et composante de socio-économique et la troisième de, euh, de la gestion intégrée. Donc euh, nous nous, euh, nous intéressons euh, surtout sur la composante de conservation euh, ou de, de, de capital naturel qui, qui, que nous l'avons démonté en un certain nombre de, 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 de composantes. Je, le, je vous laisse avec ma... Euh, alors, les aires marins protégées euh, sont créées pour euh, protéger et conserver euh, des exemples euh, représentatifs du patrimoine naturel marin. Alors, euh, chaque aire marine protégée euh, est constituée par euh, des euh, espèces clés associées à des habitats clés. Alors, alors parmi euh, ces habitats, on peut citer à titre d'exemple alors les falaises côtières, euh, les laminaires, euh, les grottes marines, euh, les coralligènes, euh, etc. Alors, afin de permettre euh, euh, à l'air marine protégée de jouer son rôle de conservation et de développement durable, euh, un plan d'aménagement et de gestion s'impose euh, pour que, euh, que tracer les, les aspects bi biotiques et biotiques de l'air protégé ainsi que les aspects culturels, euh, tracer aussi les, les objectifs euh, euh, de, de création de cette terre protégée et d'élaborer un plan d'action euh, sur le temps et sur l'espace pour euh, euh, atteindre les objectifs fixés par cette terre protégée. Voilà, merci Sémira. Donc, euh, on a déjà parlé, des, on a un peu décelé nos, nos, nos habitats, les espèces qui sont liées. Il faut savoir donc que ces espèces et ces habitats, ce sont des écosystèmes qui nous donnent des, 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 des services à nous, à nous les humains. Ces services-là, ils sont, ils sont là pour nous servir et pour notre bien-être, et qui peuvent être soit indirects ou bien indirects. Et comme vous, 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 vous le voyez, c'est des services qui peuvent être de, 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 de provisionnement. Par, par, par exemple, tout ce qu'on consomme comme être humain, le, le bois, le, de l'eau qui est pure, ça peut être aussi de, de régulation. Ça joue un rôle dans, le, dans la régulation du climat, la, 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 la purification de l'eau, le stockage de carbone. Mais c'est aussi culturel et donc c'est pour le bien-être humain, pour la santé humaine. Par exemple, tout ce qui est écotourisme, tout ce qui est, tout ce qui est le, euh, éducation culturelle, éducation environnementale. Alors, pour les impacts, il faut savoir que les activités humaines vont engendrer des effets nocifs ou négatifs sur les AMP d'une façon directe ou indirecte. À titre d'exemple, un peu on peut citer euh, le chalutage, la chasse sous-marine ou le tourisme balnéaire. Donc l'évaluation de, de ces impacts vont nous permettre d'évaluer l'état de notre air marine euh, protégé. Donc cet état, euh, peut, euh, cet état peut être dans un état... Peut être, euh, euh, l'air marine peut être... Subi, peut peut-être peut subir un, un impact réversible ou irréversible. Donc l'évaluation de ces impacts sur une échelle de 10 va nous permettre de, 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 de voir euh, un, un indice de résiliation euh, pour savoir est-ce que le, notre air marine protégé peut euh, se, se réconforter naturellement ou il faut, faut d'autres interventions donc, c'est une échelle de 10 qui va nous permettre son état. Donc, si on trouve l'impact supérieur à la résilience, c'est que notre, notre, euh, notre euh, AMP est dans un état critique. Donc, il faut euh, intervenir au niveau du plan de gestion pour réajuster les financements afin d'améliorer son état de, de santé. 
Alors, afin d'atténuer de, de, les impacts sur euh, l'air marine protégée, euh, le pays monde service écosystème qui est un dispositif économique et incitatif euh, permet d'avoir de, euh, des, des retombées économiques euh, pour l'air marine protégée pour pouvoir financer euh, les, les actions euh, permettant la conservation de, de, de ces ressources naturelles, ainsi de réduire euh, l'impact sur, euh, sur cette terre marine protégée. Et pour pérenniser ces, ces GMP, il faut, euh, euh, il faut avoir des, des financements euh, permanents, tels que les financements, tels que le bioprospection. Euh, ou la, la compensation euh, carbone, euh, la taxation et, euh, et tout ce qui est euh, amende sur euh, infraction. Bonjour. Et désolé pour le retard. Alors, ici vient le rôle euh, de, de plan de gestion, qui est un parmi les rôles de plan de gestion, qui est euh, il faut qu'il qu euh, apte à résoudre les problèmes qui causent les impacts négatifs et affectent le, les rôles de, le, le rôle des services écosystémiques des habitats et des espèces. Donc, euh, diminuer le, le score, le score euh, des impacts négatifs et, pas, et en contrepartie, augmenter euh, la résilience et donner la chance euh, à ces habitats et ces espèces pour euh, résilier contre ces, ces impacts euh, négatifs. Et merci. So thank you for that review. And was everybody clear about what we covered yesterday? Yes. Certainly group number one was. So thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Okay, so we need another group to volunteer. Let's do it now for the presentation on is today Tuesday? So to present on today's um, uh, topic that we cover, but to present on Thursday. So what team wants to uh, be responsible for Thursday's review in the morning? Don't everybody jump at it. OK, OK. What team number are you? Team number two? OK, team number two is going to take it on. Now remember what we talked about for the mentors, what we talked about different learning methods. So we've covered the visuals, we've covered PowerPoint. Now you have to find a different way to present, okay? So we're, we're upping the ante. <laughs> As a team. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So I just wanted to do, um, a really uh, quick review of what we did yesterday in these two workshops. I mean, group number one gave us an overview of the content that we covered yesterday, but we spent a lot of time uh, in the afternoon, in fact, all afternoon, really breaking down uh, what it is that our natural assets look like or our natural capital looks like in our MPA, and then understanding what are the, the impacts on our natural capital. And so I want you to go back and spend a little bit of time on this uh, this morning. I'm, I'm switching the plans <laughs> as I speak. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Um, so let's spend about 30 minutes. And each of the trainers will be with you. And for those who weren't able to really get into the section here about your management capacity, we want you to focus on that. But we're going to walk through and see if your model um, all f flows and fits together. Because if it doesn't, it's going to be a little bit wobbly uh, when we start to build the whole model in a, in a few minutes. So we're going to walk through this with you. Each one of us uh, trainers will take a, a different group. And we'll, we'll be with you. And then for some of the groups, we're going to talk about a little bit about cumulative impacts. So what we did here yesterday, if you can recall, is to look at different human use activities and the impacts that they have on your, in this case, it was seagrass beds, on your primary uh, habitat type. 
And so we kind of broke it down and did a, what we call a vulnerability or an impact analysis. And then we looked at how well our MPA could actually address those impacts. And this will be um, really important to, to spend some time on how well your MPA can address those impacts because it's going to tell you where your gaps are. It's going to tell you about the, the good news and the bad news at the same time, but it's going to help to inform you where you need to strengthen your management. And then um, I think we'll just spend about 30 minutes doing this. And for those that are ready, we can talk about the cumulative impacts. It means if you take all of these impacts together, we broke them down. In the, the case of this group here that's focusing on an MPA in, in Egypt, they had six different uh, sources of impacts that they looked at. But they looked at each one of those individually. What if you look at those all together so cumulatively to try and understand what the impacts are on seagrass beds. So there's a series of questions that we ask here. And then also we want to know if you don't take action and you have all these cumulative impacts. In other words, if the MPA wasn't there effectively managing the natural resources, then what would the impacts look like in five years? What would they look like in 10 years? So what would the condition of the resources be over time if you're not managing them properly? In this case, it would be seagrass beds. OK, so uh, let's just spend maybe 30, 40 minutes and tighten the screws on this one, uh, particularly focusing, I think, a couple of the um, groups didn't spend enough time here in this section about the capacity of the MPA. And then for those who can go on to these two sections, uh, go ahead and just move in that direction. So spend that 40 minutes really fine tuning this, this model because you're going to build uh, a model from this. Uh, that will be the next step. Okay? And then it's the time to ask any questions or find any um, sort of soft spots in your model that you're starting to build. Any questions on that? Okay, let's get started. We'll spend 40 minutes and then um, we'll move on to the next step. Sorry. <laughs> okay, um, how did that go? Do you feel like you got a little bit more clear about the, uh, the impacts on your, your habitat types and also your management capacity? Yes. Hello? <laughs> Anybody out there? <laughs> so what happened over here? You guys got into quite a discussion. You don't have to tell me the details, but tell me what you found out. Uh, yes, it was um, very interesting because uh, in our team we shared like a lot of uh, ideas between us and we learned of experience how to deal with like some impact like for example dynamites and blats and illegal fishing method and how they did it in turkey in egypt in uh, also libya and in lebanon so we try to find uh, the right way and uh, we use it to find like to say some solution yeah and it was very very uh, and, and it's taken a long time of discussion because here we have uh, uh, someone uh, in Turkey, uh, an important that he is enforcing the law. So it, for us, it is, his presence is very important because we try to understand how he can enforce this law and how Fisher are dealing with the legal uh, action. So they respect the, the action and everything. So we, we have really a good example to, to take and uh, how he's monitored. So it is important. So we try to take from him and use it in our, uh, in the MPA that you use. That's mean Lebanon, Palm Island, with a very critical. So I will let uh, my colleague talk a little bit. So. Uh, uh, good morning. So uh, in our uh, MPA, we have a big problem with illegal fishing, uh, and we cannot control it, especially in this uh, economic crisis in Lebanon. You, you hear about it. Uh, now I'm implementing a project. Uh, I cannot uh, make change with uh, fishermen. They will not change using their uh, technique, uh, illegal fishing technique. So uh, we can deal with consumer 
يعني وي شود اف ذا فيشرمان كانت باي اتس كانت سيل اتس ايليجال فيش فيش سو اف وي ديل ويز كونسيومر to not uh, deal with this fisherman, we cannot make some difference. How? Now it's uh, one project that I hope to, to deal it with this product. Uh, the proposal is now with you. So uh, our MPA will create a label, like uh, ISO label or HASP label. This is a label who, who don't know for food safety. So we will create an environmental label. And uh, all fishermen, or some of fishermen and fisheries and fish market and restaurant to get this label, they should uh, reach uh, workshops about many days and they will respect the rules. We will uh, put a cahier de charge, uh, what in English? Like a cahier de charge. Uh, a, 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 book. Di a diary of, uh, of violation. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, cahier de charge about the rule to get this label and we will control the respect of this rule. So, and we will make a campaign, a social, camp social media campaign, uh, TV campaign, uh, to uh, tell consumer not to deal with illegal, who, who don't have this label, not deal with them, uh, do not work with them, because they use insecticides. This insecticide will, uh, will uh, damage your, your, uh, yourself, etc. will damage the ecosystem. The, so. Also, we will work with uh, uh, people that have boat uh, uh, to that take people from uh, the land to the to the island. Always, uh, it it took 40 minutes. This 40 minutes can be a, a workshop for these people who are who are going to the island. So the owner of the boat should be a trainer for, for, for these people and he should attend our workshop and to get this label. Also, the boat that, are, uh, that uh, people use to go to the, to the land should have this label and uh, we will encourage people to deal with these people. Now I am implementing, implementing this project. Oh. Well, thank you. That's an outcome from this worksheet that we hadn't expected from this exercise that we hadn't expected. You guys are moving towards solutions already. Uh, but also, I think you have to be really clear where are your strengths and weaknesses in terms of your management already, your management capacity. So even when you take on new approaches, like this whole one that you described with the eco-labeling, um, do you have the capacity to take that on? So, um, and. I don't know, but I suspect maybe you don't yet. And so you're going to have to build your capacity of your MPA staff to be able to deliver a program like that and then maintain it over the long term. So this should reveal whether you have the ability to actually do that right now or not. But since you guys happen to be in the middle of a new management plan process, then that may be something you have to address as your staff capacity. So... Okay, I think we're gonna, okay. Yeah. Oui, merci, ça va pas être euh, long. Euh, juste en travaillant sur l'exercice. Euh, ah oui, ah, ok. Ok, donc juste en travaillant sur l'exercice au fur et à mesure dans le, dans le process, euh, et, euh, en mesurant un peu les, les impacts, surtout les impacts cumulatifs et, et les effets que ça va avoir sur notre AMP, euh, avec les actions qu'on a mises, on se pose un peu une question, est-ce que, est -ce que euh, les actions qu'on propose avec les moyens financiers et humains, est-ce que ça va, être, ça va être suffisant pour sauver notre AMP ça, Donc c'est une question qui revient à chaque moment parce que euh, on voit un peu la dégradation des milieux qui, qui, qui se dégrade avec rapidité, surtout si on l'accumule avec les, les, le changement climatique. Donc il y a cette question qui, qui vient, qui vient est-ce qu'on est en mesure déjà de répondre à, à, à la résilience de notre AMP avec, avec le, ce qui se passe dans le contexte actuel Stick. 
take one. <laughs> so again, I think, you know, uh, you had a revelation, so to speak, just like this group did over here, just like Palm Island did, about what are we going to do in our management plan so that we really have the capacity to be able to address some of these issues. Um, too bad we're not doing management planning. That's a different training. But, and that's the one that was done. Um, when was that? When was the Zoom management planning? Well, I forgot. Some of you took it. When was it? February or March. I forget. forget. It was a Zoom. But in, in any case, um, the point is that we happen to have two sites right now that are poised and ready to start working on new management plans. And this should all be really helpful for those purposes, too. Even though that's not, we're not doing a management planning workshop, you can use all of this information to inform you about how to put you together your plan. So I'm glad it's going to be useful in that way as well. This is like more than I can handle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I'm okay now. I'm hooked in. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about um, putting your model together. And uh, let's see, I did this one right here. So the next thing that you're going to do is actually build your model, your, so, your natural capital model. And so to start with, um, you're going to use felt pens. No pencils or anything like that. You're going to make a commitment to your natural capital model. This is how it looks in my imagination. You don't have to draw it the same way that I do. Um, but it will hook up. So this is drawn horizontally, so to speak, because it's eventually going to hook up to the social capital model. I wish I could see what was in the next slide. I can't. It's not in here. Um, but I want you to draw your own version of this. So use the full flip chart, use felt pens, refer to the work that you've been doing in these last two exercises, and build your natural capital model so that you show the relationship between your major habitat types. In this case, you're working with three habitat types. The um, ecosystem services that are associated with those habitat types. And then the species that are dependent both on the habitat types and also on the ecosystem services. Okay. This is just natural capital. We're not looking at the social side yet. Uh, after you start to diagram this, we'll work on the social side. But this is going to be the first piece. But think forward. And the way you should think forward is that then your social piece, your social capital piece over here is going to connect to all of this as well. So start to think about that. There's going to have to be another connection that, that is made to this. For now, just draw your habitats, your ecosystem services, and your species, and somehow show us how they're all connected. Are there any questions on that? OK, so you have about four. Let's try and see if you can do it in 40 minutes, but we'll give you if you need a little more time. And um, I think we all have felt pens, or we'll pass out the felt pens. Each of you have a flip chart. Uh, that you can work on. And if your map is still on your flip chart, uh, we're, we'll take it off and tape it up on the wall because we want to preserve it for some things you'll be doing later on. Okay, is it clear what you're going to be doing? You, you're going to draw your, so, and you have a handout of this as well in your packet. There's a picture of this same slide that you see right here. So you can use that as reference as well. Okay, so this morning we've continued the focus um, from yesterday on looking at the ecosystem value of the natural resources and building our, our natural capital model. And um, during, you know, when we take a break next time, walk around and look at the different models that people are building. They're all very similar, but uh, some of the teams took a different tact, like they did a circular model over in team number one over here. Um, but also I just want to say, because this discussion came up several times in different groups, um, this is not scientifically robust. It's just to show you how to build the model. 
And if you had the right people in the room and you had the right data, it could be scientifically supported. Nonetheless, the question that keeps coming up is, is this something that you would use working on these kinds of models over here and then building your natural capital model? Is that something with, that you would do with stakeholders? And my answer is yes. And I think the value of working through these kinds of models with stakeholders is a couple of things. Um, maybe it's not going to be scientifically robust how you build your model. But I think that what it will do is that it will bring out a lot of local knowledge that's, that you can capture in this model, and that will be hugely valuable. Also, as you might have noticed, there's a lot of discussion that takes place when you start to build these models. And that discussion is really um, important for building a relationship with stakeholders as well. And um, I think when stakeholders, particularly fishers who've been out on the water for a long time, are involved in a process like this, building these kinds of models, and you use their local knowledge, it, it, they feel very empowered. And they feel like they have a role to play in the management of the MPAs. So my answer would be yes, you can use this with stakeholders. Um, that sh it's actually a, a really good tool, and I have used it with stakeholders, and I would encourage you to do the same. Um, so, and there's lots of different ways you can deal with, you know, on this last section, which not all of you got to, about the loss of natural resources. If you do nothing, if there's no NPA, and you have this trend of impacts from human uses, what is this going to look like five years from now? Well, projections are really hard to do. Even if you have good data, they're hard to do. But there's other ways you can work with this. One way is to try and understand what it's going to look like five years from now, is to ask fishers, what did it look like five years ago, five years back? And what kind of change have you seen between five years ago and now? And use that as a way to project forward. Okay, if the changes have come at that rate and you have seen that, then over the next five years, what do you think it's going to look like? What do you think about the last 10 years? What kind of changes have you seen? And then project forward from that. So you adapt this kind of model depending on who your audience is that you're working with. So we're going to move forward now from the natural capital model that we've been working on. And we're going to move into the second part of the model, which is the socioeconomic or social capital piece of the model. So I'm just going to read this for purposes of translation. The general hypothesis has become that MPA should lead to win-win outcomes for conservation and development, thus satisfying the needs of conservationists, governments, fishers, tourism operators, and local communities. Okay, so that's the basis on which we're, we're building the second part of the model is to look at the socioeconomic advantages that an MPA can bring to local communities if it's managed, designed and managed um, to do so, specifically to do so. So remember we said an important foundation of your MPA has to be the goals and objectives. What is it you're trying to achieve in your MPA? And so if there's a socioeconomic component of that, then that's the model we're working from right now, both conservation and socioeconomic development. So how do we uh, achieve successful outcomes for both local communities and conservation? Uh, it, at first glance, this might seem very contradictory, but all I can say is that it's a challenge and that it's a balancing act, and there has to be compromise both ways. The reason for doing this, though, is ultimately, um, we can't be successful in MPAs, in our management of MPAs, if we don't have good buy-in from local communities. And so they need to participate both in the decision-making process and the management of the MPAs. And without that buy-in, good luck. That's all I can say. Unless you're a very remote MPA where nobody's going to be impacted by your actions, by your management plan. So we're going to be adding the second piece to this three-piece model, and that's adding social capital to the sustainability model. 
So um, we're really going to start to talk now about um, local communities, our social capital, and its relationship to natural capital. And this picture just illustrates how important it is to the local economy um, to have to build that relationship and that protection for both natural capital and development. Sorry, I'll get out of your way. So MPAs have become socially acceptable if they are able to contribute to both present and future needs and their establishment should at least not be seen as a cost that outweighs the intended benefits that the generation should be enjoying. So this is just another um, statement about the importance of the Balancing Act and what does that look like. And for those of us who've been working on MPAs for a long time, and with some exceptions, uh, we used to just think that MPAs were only about biodiversity protection. That, that is a central theme of MPAs. We cannot lose that or else there's no point in, in creating MPAs. But what we found over time is without that buy-in from local communities, that's not good enough. We can't have good success. So for others, um, it's not just important to protect biodiversity, but assess how MPAs can deliver social and economic benefits to local communities if we're going to be successful. And so where are we left right now? Our experience has shown us that we need to benefit both uh, conservation uh, side of things and also local communities. And just to bring the, the point home, this is just uh, an illustration here of um, the ocean asset value, or that's the wrong term, I should say sea asset value of the Mediterranean Sea the, from the Shared Wealth Fund. This is talking about gross national um, products, and in this case, gross marine products. And you can see it's broken down by different countries. Uh, we don't have the full data set on each country, but marine assets in the Mediterranean Sea generate uh, 5.6, this is in US dollars, trillion um, dollars worth of gross marine products per year. So this is the shared, what we call the shared wealth base of the natural capital of the Mediterranean as a whole. So you can see why this is important to um, both inside and outside of MPAs to also protect the economic value of the natural resources. And this is broken down when it's looking at the gross marine product of the of this sea in terms of annual economic value, um, which is 450 billion per year. This is ocean wide down here. 92% of that comes from tourism, 2% uh, from fisheries and aquaculture, and 6% from direct services uh, enabled by the ocean. So that's at a, a global scale. So, you know, this is just a way to, to bring some large economic value to, to the ocean and the sea. So we've been working on all day yesterday and this morning the natural capital. So as you know, what that means now is the taking stock of ecosystems and natural resources. Also the ecosystem services that flow out of the natural resources in our MPAs. You can have all these slides. So. Um, you're welcome to take pictures of them, but you can also just have them. And then now what we're going to talk about and focus on is the human well-being of local communities uh, in and around MPAs and how now that has become a part of the picture of a successful MPA. How do you address both sides? I'm not sure how to get out of your guys' way. But. So... What we say is that natural capital produces human well-being. So if you want to have human well-being, you're going to have to protect your natural capital. It's a, it's a, a symbiotic relationship. And many local communities depend on those natural resources. Some of them, 100% um, of their income is dependent on those natural resources, usually from fisheries resources. This happens to be a fisher in France, and he... Uh, he harvests mollusks, 
But um, as you can see in his bins, even though he's a, harvest, a mollusk harvester, you see blue crabs, invasive species in all of his bins, which are competing with his primary fishery, which is mollusk. And so somehow, uh, this is a, a climate-driven issue for this fisher. Somehow, is there a role, we ask, for MPAs to create some kind of correction for local communities in this, in this kind of situation. We're not going to change the fact that the blue crabs are invasive species. Um, we can't pretend that we have control over nature by any means. What we have to do is look at the human side and where can we make some changes there. So um, yet the act of declaring an MP alone, let's not be mistaken. Just because we create an MPA, it doesn't mean that we're either protecting our natural capital or our social capital automatically. It goes back to this fact that, and that's why this is such an important part of <coughs> the analysis that we do, if the, if the MPAs are not well designed and if they're not well managed to meet your goals and objectives, particularly if they're both social and conservation-based objectives, then an MPA is no good. And we sort of tout the fact that MPAs will solve a lot of problems. As you can see, it's going to take a lot of work to manage them well to solve a lot of problems. And of course, um, different MPAs take on um, and incorporate different management regimes in their approach to, to managing the natural resources. And this is just a really obvious example that of a fully protected area, uh, harbors more biodiversity, supports more biodiversity, as opposed to a highly protected, a lightly protected, or a minimally protected MPA. So depending on the management approach you take, and this is not the only thing, but this is just one good example that's easy to illustrate, whatever approach that you take is, is going to determine the kinds of results that you get. Of course, um, for all of these, it's just not putting aside areas as highly protected or creating no-take zones. You've got to uh, monitor, you've got to enforce, you've got to educate people about them. So none of these comes with just the designation of different kinds of zones. Uh, so what we, in order to understand, uh, one way we understand how successful we are at um, conserving our natural resources in, in an MPA is to look at livelihoods. We use that as what we call a proxy to let us know what kind of success that we're having in MPAs. Um, fishing and subsistence harvesting um, is the primary livelihood for many local communities. And so to measure the success in the areas of small scale fisheries, or subsistence fisheries is one way to understand how well we're doing our job as MPA managers and practitioners. Um, th the data does tell us, though, um, the higher the level of protection in the MPAs, and if they're well enforced, well monitored, that we are seeing pretty clear results globally from no-take zones, as an example of one management approach. And the way that we're measuring the, the success is um, CPUE, which is catch um, per unit of effort. And that's one way that we can tell whether we're, we're not only um, achieving the conservation, but also the socioeconomic benefits that we hope to in an MPA. But however, when you take a, a more um, radical approach like creating a network of MPAs uh, like some of these sites have here for instance the the one over um, the one you guys are working over on table number two you have a series of no-take zones and no access zones in um, in Morocco so in a case like that um, we're seeing pretty good results but what's happening if you displace fishermen fishers, and there's no place for them to fish, the short-term effect on them is going to be great economically. At the long term, they'll get benefits from the recovery of the fisheries, but over the short term, there's going to be a huge impact on fishers. So you have to consider that when you're taking uh, measures that are really effective, like putting in 
into your MPA a network of no-take zones. So what, what happens in that interim period when there may be a loss of income or a reduction of income for fishers as, as the transition is taking place for the, the, the uh, implementation of the no-take zones? So one thing that we have looked at is alternative livelihoods, helping fishers, as MPAs, helping fishers to create alternative livelihoods as a way to either replace or supplement their income, particularly during those transition <coughs> periods. But it's what we say a really mixed bag, meaning that is that any better to have them enter into another livelihood and considering the impacts that that might have on the natural resources as opposed to just letting them continue to fish. And primarily, the one of the primary areas that we have allowed that shift to take place from fishing to another livelihood is to move fishers into tourism, pesca tourism or into the tourism industry. And then the question is, what is the net benefit to the natural resources of doing that if the impacts from tourism are just as great as they are from fishing. So this is kind of a wholesale mistake that we've been making over the last couple of decades about thinking, okay, we'll take the, the pressure off fisheries and we'll let them go into tourism without accounting for the impacts of tourism. So when we say a mixed bag, we mean, well, maybe we're not achieving the same results that we'd hoped to. We didn't really think about what the impacts of tourism are. So um, there are uh, benefits to tourism, to MPAs, uh, in regards to uh, using that as a finance mechanism for MPAs. So we talked about, for instance, fee systems yesterday, paying for ecosystem services, PESs. And so the tourism industry is a natural avenue to raise funds for MPAs. But you have to think of the, of the balance. If we're creating so many impacts from tourism, even if we're raising revenues and raising awareness about our MPAs with, with, the, with visitors, is that a good trade-off or not? I'm not saying yes, no, or otherwise, but you do have to consider. And it's just like the case that you guys said yesterday in Palm Island, that even though you put in a visitor fee for some visitors, the cost of cleaning up after visitors is actually greater than the revenue that's being generated by the fee system. So you have to think of all these kinds of trade-offs and, and the balance of whether this is worth it or not. Um, and the other part of that is, what is the level of community benefit from the tourism industry? And this has become a big issue in the MED, where so many MPAs are really trying to amplify and highlight the value of the MPAs as a tourism attraction. <clears throat> so uh, the benefits to local communities, for the most case where there is data, local communities around MPAs shows that local communities are not benefiting very well from tourism in general. There's too much what we call leakage. The money coming in vis-a-vis -vis tourism is not ending up in the pockets of local communities or in the MPAs pockets for that matter. <clears throat> so the leakage is, what that term means is that uh, particularly if you're looking at tourists coming, either international tourists or domestic tourists coming from a, a ways away, that many of the expenses associated or the, the, the revenues spent by tourists are going somewhere else. You can see for total holiday expenses here like airfare, insurances, taxes, um, online travel agencies and so forth, none of that is realized by the local community or by the MPA. Even when people get in country, there's you know visa fees, airport taxes, uh, expenses at the local destination, very little of that ends up in the pockets of local communities. And then even when they're staying in and around your MPA uh, with local communities, many of the businesses the hotels, the lodges, the restaurants, the dive uh, boat operations are owned by entities outside of, of that community and many of them from outside of that country. 
So who's getting all the revenue? It's not the local communities. And I'll show you a little bit about the data here. Less than 10% is left to benefit the local communities. And that's usually just in regards to, uh, to uh, uh, paying for labor costs. So it's not, there's no money actually going in people's pockets. So this is what we call the, the leakage drain of tourism. It's not ending up, tourism dollars are not ending up within local communities. So again, we have to really consider when we're encouraging the development as a socioeconomic uh, way to uh, support local communities, whether tourism is of the kind of benefit that we hoped it would be. So guess what? You're going to break it down and see what's happening in your own MPA. Let me see what's here. You're going to um, work on worksheet 2.1. It's a smaller worksheet that you have in your packet there. Um, we want you to do one per table, but you can all sort of work through your individual sheets. And basically what we're going to ask you to do is to look at one of two socioeconomic drivers, not both of them, for your MPA. So if tourism is an economic driver for local communities, then check the box. You're going to do, this is going to, you're going to fill this out based on tourism activities in and around your MPA. If fisheries is more of an economic driver in and around your MPA, check that box and just focus on fisheries activities and break them down into different kinds of activities. You'll see there's a bunch of boxes. So the first thing is specific type of activity. So if it's tourism, break it down, dive boat operators, marina operators, whatever it might be, pesca tourism, and break it down into different activities that are actually occurring in your MPA. Is this tourism provider a direct or indirect user of the MPA? Well, a dive boat operator, I'd say yes, they're a direct user of the MPA. If it's a restaurant, maybe for tourists, they're indirect. They may be selling fish that was caught in the MPA, but they're not actually extracting the fish. So we call it an indirect user. Um, we want to then kind of profile them as stakeholders. And if there's any cultural sensitivity around this, well, you will know that in your own MPA. But these are sometimes important questions for us to know so we can understand what kind of stakeholders we're working with. What is the gender of uh, most of the people in that particular part, that sector of the, say, tourism industry. What is the age profile? What is the ethnic profile? Wealth distribution. Is it just a couple people at the top, the boat owners, who are making the money on a dive boat operation? Or is the wealth, the money generated from that activity, pretty much shared across um, all of those participating as, say, staff? Homogeneity of that group, of that stakeholder group. Do they get along or are there factions and they're at odds with each other? You want to know this information so you understand how to work with them. What, um, and then the relationship to ecosystem services. So we're, again, we're talking about this tourism activity, dive boat operators. What provisional ecosystem services are they dependent on? Well, healthy reefs and fisheries resources, biodiversity. What regulated ecosystem services are they dependent on? Probably clean water, good water quality. What cultural ecosystem services are they dependent on? What is their, this is about their relationship to the MPA. What's their attitude towards the MPA? Do they have an attitude? Is it positive or negative? Do you have a working relationship with them or not? And then does the MPA have a relationship with this group? And explain what that, uh, an established relationship with that group or not? And then explain what that is. Okay, so you have, let me see how long, we're kind of making it up as we go along. Why don't we try and do this in about 40 minutes? Uh, we can work with you in, in your small groups, but you can work on the worksheets that are in your packets. I think everybody should have it. Okay, are there any questions? And just to be clear, um, we, we want to start to build the linkages. So our objective with this exercise is to start to build the linkages and interests of stakeholders to the health, the health of the natural resources.
to uh, introduce the next concept, just a couple of slides, and then we're going to do the next connecting uh, worksheet before we go to lunch. Okay, so now we're starting to see what that dependency is on the natural resources. And that was the, the point of the exercise that you just went through was to really see where local livelihoods, whether it's from the tourism industry or from the fishing industry, are highly dependent on the natural resources themselves. We did a little profiling of those communities because before you start to work with stakeholders, you always need to know something about their background if you're not already working with them. So we're going to really get into a little bit more depth in terms of what their relationship is to the natural resources uh, in the next stage that we're going to move into. So uh, MPA-related development has the potential to contribute to both livelihoods and, um, and provide beneficial socioeconomic uh, benefits to local communities. However, we have to be really careful as we start to move into this realm of looking out after the livelihoods as MPAs for local communities. If we put too much attention on the development of local livelihoods, we lo lose what our purpose is. And conservation is our, our highest goal, is our main purpose. Otherwise, we wouldn't be a marine protected area. However, that there are MPAs that have put so much emphasis on socioeconomic development that they've allowed absolutely crazy things to happen in their MPAs, like the picture that you can see here. So what we say is that we really strive to create a balance between the conservation benefits and the socioeconomic benefits that we want to realize for our MPAs. And oftentimes when we uh, go overboard on the socioeconomic benefits for local communities, we actually end up doing more damage than good. And this is just an example from the MED here, where there's so much tourism development that local people don't have that connection to the sea anymore because there isn't any space left for them to have it. So what have we actually done? We've created socioeconomic opportunities. At the same time, we've taken away that cultural or intrinsic relationship that people have with, uh, with the coastal areas. So um, this isn't easy, creating this balance between conservation and um, socioeconomic development, so or sustainable development. So really what we have to do is try to create the balance between, as you can see up here, natural capital and economic capital, or what we're calling social capital, and also the governance considerations. So the other element of this is, how are you going to actually create a governance model or a management model that allows you to keep that balance between the two? And that's what we'll talk about more in detail tomorrow. But just want you to keep this balancing act in mind. So we're going to go to the next exercise. I think that actually we can do it in 30 minutes. And um, what we'll do is there's a worksheet 2.2. It's on the back side of the worksheet that you have right now. It's kind of the continuation of the work that we've been doing. But we're going to just take, um, I think there's just space for a couple of activities in that. Again, you'll stick to either fishing activities or tourism activities. And now what we're trying to do is establish that relationship between social capital and natural capital, the dependency of social capital on natural capital. So we're, we're trying to make a link to the second part of our model, which you'll be building this afternoon. So again, we go back to the same activities that you put on worksheet 2.1, the one that you just did. We talk about what's the overall benefit of that activity to local communities. Um, and if it's a fishing activity, it's the benefits going to be that they derive their livelihood from it. The primary benefactors may be um, small scale fishers. The secondary benefactors may be like local residents or fish market, what we call mongers, people who sell the fish. And then we have an evaluation of, so what's the overall level benefit to the community of this particular type of fishing activity? And you can see the scoring system is down here below. You've gotten used to the scoring systems that we used yesterday. 
And then the second series of questions is, what are the impacts on the species that they're targeting from a particular fishery? If it's trammel nets, what are they targeting in that fishery? What are the impacts on habitats? Uh, it's probably from the gear type that you're using. What are the impacts on the ecosystem services? Well, bycatch could be one of those impacts on ecosystem services. Uh, what's the impact, what are the impacts on local infrastructure, um, impacts on the local human community, and then other types of impacts that might, they might, there might be. And then there's an overall school score for the level of impact that we, we um, will get from down here and the overall benefit level, which we just extract from this number over here. So we're trying to see what the costs and the benefits are from that activity taking place in the MPA. Okay, are there any questions about that? Let's see how we do in 30 minutes, try and get through most of your uh, category of act, categories of activities, and, um, and then we'll go to lunch, and we'll, we'll debrief on this after lunch. Okay, so now what we're going to do, um, since you did your analysis on your social capital, is we're going to build the second part of the model. So remember the first part of the model, which you drew over here on your flip charts? This was your natural capital piece of the model. And it was basically you took your habitat types, the ecosystem services, and then the species associated with both of those. <laughs> And you connected those. Good luck undoing this. This is just like the exercise you just did. You have to figure out how to untangle all of this. So we're going to add the next piece to it. We're going to add the social capital piece to it based on the two worksheets that you just did, worksheet 2.1 and worksheet 2.2, those sheets that you just completed before lunch. Now you're going to take information from there and create the second part of the model. So the second part of the model is basically what are the livelihoods that are dependent on the natural capital in your MPA? Okay, so this is a list of, this is an example of different livelihoods, both from um, the fishing side and from the uh, tourism side. So you need to lift those, um, and of course you're either working for our purposes today, you're either working on the fishing side of livelihoods or you're working on the tourism. I, what do you, you guys did fishing. What, which side did you guys do? Fishing? Tourism. tourism. Okay, and you guys did fishing or tourism? Tourism. Okay, tourism, tourism, and fishing. And so basically, what these do is these match up to, and I'll show you in a second what that looks like, these match up to each of the different um, ecosystem components that we were talking about before. These are primary users of the natural resources. Okay, primary users of the natural resources. These are secondary benefactors of the natural resources, of the natural capital. And so we're looking at three components here, the primary user groups or benefactors of the natural resources or your natural capital, the secondary, and you have this filled out in your first worksheet you did today, and then how does the community as a whole benefit? And so this is kind of an added piece because community well-being is sort of the new threshold for what we're trying to achieve in MPAs along with conservation. So improved wealth distribution among the community as a result of all these livelihoods. Improved um, tax base. So municipalities care about tax bases. Uh, they, they get to pave roads and they'll provide services with us. Community well-being as a whole, however you want to define that. And then continuity of the maritime heritage. So this community gets to stay connected to and continue to extract their livelihood from, from the marine environment. So I need to get in here. So just to show you how it connects, maybe you should sit there so I can work from both sides. 
So this piece is the one you're developing. This is the one you already developed, but you can see how the two connect. This is directly connecting to the entire natural capital piece. It's not specific to the species, but it's specific to the natural capital model as a whole. So you're going to work on a flip chart, and you're going to build your next part of the model, your social capital part of the model, and connect it to your natural capital. OK? So we'll get, get you back up at, at the flip charts. Let's make sure. Can you guys help and make sure they have flip chart paper on each new flip chart paper and pens? That would be great. And we're going to spend, uh, let's see what we, uh, we didn't plan. So uh, let's spend about 30 minutes, if you can, creating your, your social capital piece of your model. OK, are there any questions? You understand why you're doing this in building your model? OK. And we'll continue to work with you in case you need any support in any way. So, because this run through, I think a lot of this you know already. It's come up in so many of the exercises. We're going to be looking at um, the role of MPAs in actually supporting the livelihoods. In a lot of the groups, we jumped forwards to this. So um, I don't think there'll be anything very new, but it'll be useful to recap it at the moment. And then we're going to have another exercise after this based on the approach um, given here. So, um, so just to summarize, we've um, uh, talked about the natural capital and the social capital. So we're now we're going to look at what what is the added value of an MPA? Um, so we're going to look at it in um, four, four aspects of this, OK? Uh, the first one is to actually really create the benefit from an MPA. You need to be thinking about this at the very beginning of setting up the MPA. Some of you may not necessarily have been involved in that. Uh, so that's at the design stage. Uh, that's been mentioned several times before. Uh, then you need to be thinking about that when you're actually managing the impacts in the MPA. We're going to go through these in more detail shortly. Uh, we've talked a lot about the access of local communities um, to the various uh, natural cash capital, and we've talked today about social capital. So removing barriers uh, for local communities. And um, the fourth one is actually supporting livelihood diversification. These are the things that an MPA can support and help with uh, to improve the livelihoods of communities. So um, looking first at uh, designing MPAs to enhance livelihoods, I just wondered if anybody's got an example themselves of having been involved in designing an MPA where right at the beginning we thought about how it should be designed to benefit the local community. And I think there were some examples given yesterday. Anybody? Somebody talked. I think Elsa Hosima Morocco. What? Yes. Do you want to? I'll, I'll, I'll come around. Yeah. Just very briefly, just so that people get the idea. Yes, uh, just the example of Hosima was uh, yes. a concrete case. Yeah. Because in the first, uh, it, it was uh, rejected by the, the users, the fishermen, and actually they recapture with, uh, with, with stakeholders, so they, they make an, another, uh, another zoning who was uh, shared by the users. Exactly. So that, that's, um, that's a very good example. Uh, we had the same situation in the UK when we were designing our MPAs, and um, we had a lot of stakeholder groups from all sectors. Because the thing is, as we all know, MPAs are supposed to be able to save the world, essentially. They, we promise all these benefits from them, but unless um, a site is actually designed and managed appropriately and effectively, you're not necessarily going to get that success. So these are the, some of the key points in designing an MPA. Uh, as we've heard, like in Morocco, including the stakeholders in the design process and taking account of their knowledge, 
Um, having the strong political will and support behind the MPA right at the design stage makes a huge difference. Uh, the scientific aspects of size and design, uh, the importance of the natural resources, the natural capital, um, and the species, and, and the issue of connectivity, which we won't have time to go into today here. And some of you will be familiar with some of the guidance for design, and we've talked quite a bit about the importance of no-take zones, which is a, a sort of fundamental issue. We've also had the quiz yesterday. Anyone remember how small the area is of no-take zones in the Mediterranean? I won't test you again, uh, but just it is something to think about. Um, so, and. There are, we, we heard the uh, Morocco example, but another nice example is Toro Guachetto in Italy, which some of you may have heard of. It's been a very successful MPA. It's an interesting one because it's gone through a lot of phases and they have had a lot of problems with local communities in the past until they got the process right. And so they now have uh, no-take zones, and, um, but areas where the fishermen can fish. And they've found a big improvement for the local communities in terms of increased catches to the extent actually I'm not sure when this map dates from but they're now planning to expand the reserve with the local fishermen who've actually proposed the expansion of the reserve. Uh, I think we may hear similar in Gokova tomorrow. <coughs> so um, designing um, the MPA for fisheries, that's why no take zones um, come in very importantly. One important point to remember though is that we like to think MPAs are going to be win-win situations, but uh, in reality there's often a sector, today we did a stakeholder analysis, there is often a sector that doesn't do so well out of it or that doesn't benefit so much. In the case of fisheries, it's very much artisanal small-scale fisheries uh, that benefit from no-take areas and the spillover effect. But the uh, commercial fisheries may not benefit so much, and you may have to be thinking about that in the design. Uh, similarly, tourism, it's important to think about how uh, the design of the MPA can actually help uh, benefit uh, tourism livelihoods. And we've very clearly got this um, effect now of MPAs. It's variously known as um, the designation effect or the, the honeypot effect in that an MPA is like a hive and attracts all the bees to it. And in many places around the world where an MPA has been put in, it's caused a huge increase in tourism uh, with associated benefits but also potentially problems. So this is just an example, an analysis in um, MPAs in uh, mainly in France, I think, uh, to show the increase in divers and recreational use of, uh, of the MPA, because divers actually want to go to sites that have been protected. Uh, this is a UK example. Uh, it's a very interesting one. Lime Bay was set up um, with in initially with a lot of opposition from the fishermen, but eventually with their support, again, realisation that it had to be done with the fishermen, it was set up to manage fisheries. And although the divers did use the area, uh, it was only after the MPA had, created, had been created that we got a huge increase in the numbers of divers visiting the area and the charter boats uh, for tourists and things. It suddenly became extremely popular. So um, we've designed an MPA, we hope, for the benefit of local communities, but until we actually manage it in the way we'd like to do, in the way that we need to, you're not necessarily going to get those benefits materialising, actually coming into practice. So management, uh, we've talked quite a bit about um, management already uh, and we know that it's complex and that fundamentally we want to be thinking about this cycle of management where we see how well we're doing, we assess how well the management is to see if our interventions and measures are being effective. We learn what the gaps are, you've been doing some of that today, identifying gaps in the management and that then informs uh, the next version of the management plan or your next annual plan, whatever that might be. And all this together uh, 
you're aiming, to, as well as protecting the biodiversity, uh, to have social and economic benefits. Um, so, one, we, this is, again has come up today. Um, we've just been talking about it with the team, this team's group. You sort of feel that if you can increase tourism, if you've had more hotels, more people coming to MPAs, this will be very beneficial and uh, improve livelihoods. But these tourism itself, of course, can have numerous impacts. And this is just a chart. I'm not going through it in detail, but to show uh, from the different types of tourism, uh, the various types of threats and impacts and the intensity of these. And really, at any site, one needs to be thinking about this. You might want to do a, a detailed threat analysis. So um, one of the ways to address this uh, is through best management practices, which I'm sure is a term you've, you've heard of. It's, it's the standard approach now in many countries, not just for protected areas, in all types of life, you have best management practices for schools, for hospitals, etc. And so these are um, the ways to do things that we've learned from experience work best and, and have most success. And so that they, in the case of tourism, so that would uh, ensure that you had the least impact um, from the tourism activity, that the tourism itself would be uh, a good, good quality for the tourist who comes, and that they, it helps to benefit the MPA uh, in the long term. And best management practices, ideally, it's great if they can be used on a voluntary basis. So in a hotel, you, a best management practice there is, I think you leave your towel on the floor if you want it uh, washed. But the best management practice, you hang it up so that the hotel doesn't use water every day to wash all the towels. So that's a voluntary best management practice. But then there are other ones where you do actually have, have it um, regulated. It could be through permits or actual prohibitions. Or you might, in an, in an MPA or somewhere, uh, spatial planning, you might have it through a zoning system. So just some specific examples uh, uh, related to, an, to MPAs. Anchoring, this is one of the commonest problems um, in an MPA. Uh, we know all the, the issues it causes, particularly to Posidonia and particularly to coralligenous um, habitats in the Mediterranean. Um, and we've talked already, somebody gave an example of eco moorings that have been put in which have many benefits and can be done on a voluntary basis or, or through a more organized legislated system. Similarly, lots of ways in which boat operations can be managed to improve both the um, protection of the biodiversity, uh, but also the quality of the tourism, the boat operation for the visitor to an MPA. So uh, slow motoring, uh, being careful how the hazardous materials are disposed of, uh, limiting the use of anti-fouling paints and so on. Uh, and snorkeling and scuba diving, one of the most uh, important activities for MPAs, and I don't think we need to go in detail all through the various um, management practices that we need to make sure are being observed uh, in an MPA, and which might be an actual legal requirement, or you might just ask uh, visitors to the park to be very careful not to harass the wildlife, not to touch the, the coral, etc. Uh, so, uh, and then thinking again a little bit further away from the MPA itself, uh, thinking about recreational fishing, seafood, and souvenirs. Uh, we're talking about these with our secondary uh, beneficiaries. Um, the MPA can play an important role in managing things like um, souvenir collection that, that uh, isn't sustainable at all, of which there's a lot, and uh, trying to encourage uh, tourists and visitors to the MPA to eat sustainable food uh, in, in, in their restaurants when they eat after that visit to the MPA. 
Um, so just a, a little more on um, best, some best management practices in relation to fisheries uh, and livelihoods. Um, so there's, I think again, you're all familiar, the two main impacts of fisheries, of course, are overfishing, and for that you need to reduce effort, and then uh, the damage that the fishing gear can cause to the habitat and the various, and other species, the various ways in which that can be uh, uh, managed. Um, reducing effort, um, the, again back to Torre Guachetto in Italy which has, um, it has pioneered many uh, very good practices uh, with the fishermen and it's very interesting the arrangements they've developed with the fishers. Uh, not only is the zoning but they also have this system of t a time based restrictions. So. Fishers can only go into the NPA on certain days. This has all been negotiated over a long time with the fishers um, and a, a whole range of ways in which they've agreed to reduce the fishing in the NPA. And the Fish NPA Blue 2 project, I think you, some of you may be familiar with, but that's got a lot of examples. And these are things that could be tested in, in other NPAs too. So uh, it's a good example. Um, the, the issue of uh, gears that contribute to bycatch, again, a lot of examples of this, uh, ways in which uh, the gear can be changed so that the bycatch is reduced or eliminated. Uh, we know about different types of fish traps um, that only allow certain species in. Uh, turtle excluder devices, they've been around for, for decades now and are well tested, so they should be being used. Uh, and then we know a lot about how to reduce and eliminate um, bird catch, seabird catch from fishing gear. So all these can be um, really the, the technologies for these um, kinds of fishing, the solutions are there, and it's MPAs could do so much to encourage um, this, these kind of methods to stop it, to no longer be being used. And then again, an MPA is in a rather special position in being able to actually test uh, new approaches. And this is an ex another example from Italy, Bonifacio uh, Natural Reserve, where <coughs> they've, um, they had uh, an old system of fishing with traps uh, made of, um, I think, with rushes and things that were then, um, it was then lost. They went over to much more damaging traps and they've brought in the, the, the old approaches again with the fishermen. They've kind of rediscovered uh, the old techniques and they've also at the same time brought in new, some of these new traps and techniques. And they're working with the fishermen in the MPA to actually work out what works best for the fishermen and what protects the natural capital, to go back to that expression, of the MPA itself. And then with an MPA, of course, you can encourage them to collect the data and actually uh, use the information they've got to encourage the new methods to be used. Now, moving on to the third um, way in which MPAs could, can help with uh, livelihoods and local communities, the issue of removing barriers to access. Often local communities don't have actually have the wherewithal, have the means to uh, access their, the important resources, whether they're natural or social. And an MPA can help with this. So, um, and of course, it's absolutely crucial that communities can access the resources in some way or another, and that they can see themselves how they are benefiting from the MPA if they're going to be supportive. So there are various barriers that <clears throat> will run very quickly through. So one might be sort of the very simple, straightforward ones. There might be regulations uh, that they can't do certain things, which perhaps might need uh, rethinking, perhaps not quite fair. It might simply be a case of geographical location. That might be difficult to change, but an MPA might um, be able to think about that. Coastal development is, of course, a huge uh, issue. We saw the, the, pic the picture of the beach absolutely full of tourists and hotels so that local people couldn't actually even access the water and so on. I won't spend too much time because we can 
go through this in the exercise, but that's to give you a few ideas. Uh, then having the access to the technology uh, and the um, material and equipment these days to actually access resources in the best possible way. And an MPA, we mentioned the example of MPA helping um, fishermen test out new, new gear. So an MPA can help in many ways there. Um, access to markets, that's uh, where I think we perhaps saw that particularly in COVID when all the fish markets and other markets and supply chains all halted and suddenly people found that they just didn't have access to, to their normal supplies and markets and uh, trade and things. And I think a lot of places learnt lessons from that and a lot of work's been done on small scale fisheries since then on making sure that they're more secure. And again, MPAs can, can help with that. Uh, and then there are a whole range of other obstacles that, that uh, can create barriers for local communities. Uh, so just to uh, give a few examples, I thought. Um, so looking at this issue of, uh, we're all for time. <laughs> uh, this issue of, um, uh, having actual local people having access to uh, an MPA. Uh, marine spatial planning, I think probably you're all familiar with that term. Many countries that's being brought in and that uh, MPAs fit within that, of course, with where you have right from the beginning a planning system where uh, the areas are zoned to different activities. Um, I think tomorrow when we go to Gokova, we're going to hopefully see the zoning they've used there. I think they've got zoning for fishing and for tourism. Uh, and the, there are many examples. And uh, I'm rushing through this rather because we've got to do the exercise, but I'd like to collect some examples uh, perhaps at the end of this to see if anyone uh, can give any, a good example. Um, an MPA can also um, help by providing support to local communities in ways that you might not think of. But, um, for example, providing support to local people in terms of um, their ability to use computers. Uh, there are quite a lot of MPAs that are now introducing or helping to raise the funds to provide fishermen with smartphones that can then record catches and have all the information about an MPA and can actually be used to, to assist with enforcement. So there are, there's a, a lot of tools out there that are now available through technology and MPAs are often in a good position to have heard about these and be able to introduce them to local communities. Um, and then in terms of markets and um, value-added activities, um, we've talked about how um, uh, MPAs can help bring e e um, income to local communities through things like restaurants. We've, if you think again of your secondary beneficiaries, uh, and MPAs themselves can help to encourage restaurants. I think we're going to be hearing about the invasive species um, issue. Uh, I'm familiar, the one I'm familiar with is in Belize where the marine protected areas are now helping the local restaurants with the lionfish problem. And the MPAs are now really promoting uh, local restaurants and um, providing all sorts of things like competitions for cooks and things for people to produce the best recipes for lionfish to try and re reduce the invasive species problem there. So that's benefiting the restaurants, uh, helping with a threat and an impact in the um, MPAs in Belize, and in a way benefiting both the natural capital and the social capital and supporting livelihoods. Uh, another example, this is uh, Iroi's Marine Protected Area in France. It's a great big one in northwest France uh, with a lot of uh, local fishing there, uh, fishermen, fishing communities, very traditional fishing communities that have done a whole range of activities exploiting different types of marine resources. And in planning their uh, MPA, they worked, they had a long stakeholder process working with the different groups to see how 
what activities, uh, it should say aquaculture, should, where they could use aquaculture in particular within the MPA without causing damage to the natural resources, of course, the marine biodiversity. And they've been supporting, they haven't necessarily been, it's not the MPA staff themselves who've been doing the work, but through the MPA, they've got support to create um, a whole set of projects uh, that you are based either in the MPA or just outside it that provide benefit to the MPA and to the local communities. And this is, uh, shows, I mean, it's not only aquaculture fishing, there's a lot of tourism there. Uh, I've visited it. It's, it's on a big scale, possibly a bigger scale than, than some of you are dealing with. But um, it's very interesting to see the innovative ideas they've, they've actually uh, come up with. And then again, back with to Tori Guachetto, uh, using this a lot as it is a perfect model for how an MPA uh, with the fishing communities can actually help to benefit each other. And in this case, this is part of the work that's been done. Uh, the MPA encouraged the setting up of a cooperative uh, to bring all the fishers together. So through that, they're able to deal with a lot of legal issues uh, and get income, improved income and access to markets. So uh, and there have been uh, a lot of uh, MPAs in Mexico have done similar things, working with the fishing cooperatives, uh, and both can benefit from it. Uh, so just a few examples to um, show some of these uh, actual activities in, in practice, because once you've sort of helped to build the capacity of the local community to do these uh, activities that will benefit them, sometimes called alternative livelihoods, I, d I don't necessarily like the term alternative because they often uh, still involve fishing. They're, they're a, a more advanced form or a better activity, if you like. It brings in more money. So Egadi MPA, another one in Italy, uh, they've very much taken on board the concept of pesca tourism, which some of the groups have already discussed. Uh, it's, it's emerging, particularly in the Mediterranean, where fishermen really, in a, quite an organized way, uh, can start to benefit from tourism. Not necessarily directly through fishing, though that might be involved, but also by using their boats to take tourists out and doing eco-guiding. And um, in Agadi, they've, they've managed to generate quite a lot of uh, money for the local community from that. Uh, this is a rather different example. Sekov, I'm not from Slovenia. I don't know how you pronounce Sekovli. Uh, MPA. This is a great example. It's actually a Ramsar site in some old disused salt pans where they used to make the salt. Uh, so half of the original salt pans are this Ramsar site, uh, nature reserve, marine nature reserve, and the other half is now uh, still a commercial salt pan, but they use the traditional techniques. And as a result of using the traditional techniques, it's become a big tourist attraction. And so they sell products, they sell traditionally um, produced salt for an increased price. And um, it's, it's a very effective way of uh, involving a lot of people from the community and retaining the history of the area. Uh, and another example of course this is labels uh, and we, with the Lebanon group we talked about eco labels uh, because they're looking at uh, introducing the idea of labeling the fish uh, products from the MPA or, or giving fishermen, I mean there are various ways you can do it, you can either label the fish or the fishing groups or the technique or whatever um, and, and having um, uh, a fish or a product from the MPA that you know is sustainable, guaranteed is sustainable, and that can bring in income. Uh, again, this is being done a lot in France. We tried to do it in one or two places in England, but it hasn't been so successful yet. And um, I think we're going to see that in the Gokova, possibly the gala dinner. Are we eating? <laughs> I don't know if we're eating labelled fish, or but I think here in Turkey we there is some. I don't know if our Turkish colleagues can explain or, 
but I think you're starting a labeling scheme, is that right? Or certification scheme, or branding scheme. I, I don't know the details, we'll hear from AKD perhaps. So um, I think, so these are the four aspects that we've run through today, very fast, but you're going to be able to think more about it because the exercise we're going to do after tea is directly related to this in that for your MPA you're going to look at the way in which it's been designed to um, benefit livelihoods and local communities, how it's being managed, is it being managed in a way that will um, benefit local communities again and improve the livelihoods, uh, what are the barriers that might still exist and can they be removed and what might be the way to remove them. And then these various ways you might experiment or actually set up, help a local community to set up uh, some kind of activity. So the exercise, we'll look at those four, if there's time, look at those four um, components. And I think, is it the tea break? Should we go, so we'll go ahead with the um, uh, the exercise. So the reason we're going to do this is to make sure that we understand for the MPA the added value that it can bring to, to the local communities, um, both in terms of protecting natural resources and ensuring uh, socioeconomic development. So again, getting this, this balance between uh, the protection that could disadvantage some of the local community, but actually other ways we can make it actually provide advantages to the local community. So the uh, worksheet looks like this. Um, we do have big ones, which well, yeah, but we've got big ones to go on the wall. Uh, oh, you've got them. Okay, that's good. Um, so um, there are f the four, you'll see on it, there are the four um, components, designing the MPA, uh, managing the impacts, removing the barriers, and ideas for supporting livelihood diversification. And in a few places, some examples have been, these are just examples, so um, you can use them or, or cross them out if they don't apply to your MPA. And then... Um, describe, so in the case of uh, designing the MPA, what aspects of the design have been thought about already uh, that, um, that affect uh, livelihoods and local people? Uh, has, has that been done appropriately uh, or would you like to do, actually like to do more? Don't forget that uh, managing an, an MPA is an adaptive process. It's never finalized. Even the design may change. So what would you like to be doing more? And then there's a scoring system, which I think it's at the bottom of the sheet. Sorry, we haven't got it there. But I think the scoring system is explained at the bottom or at the top. I can't read it on the screen. But we can explain the scoring to you. And then similarly... Uh, impacts, uh, removing the barriers and supporting livelihood diversification. Uh, and I would suggest they try a couple for each section rather than try and complete. Would that make sense? Yes. Don't try and complete the whole thing. Perhaps do two, two design aspects, two impacts, um, two removing barriers. Yeah. Okay important part of uh, the analysis and thinking about how MPAs can benefit social communities, uh, local communities, and how the socio-economic aspects can be integrated uh, for the final model. So um, you're going to need to be able to remember what you've done today, despite the fact that we have an outing tomorrow, which we'll hear about shortly. But before that, I wondered if anybody would like to share their thoughts about um, this component of the work and the exercise you've just done. Has anybody got any questions or queries or comments? What? 
Did you find it particularly useful? Did you find your MPA is really well designed or is well managed? Or did it help to identify some of the problems? Mahmoud. This, I have to first say that the team, the big team, if I can call them that, did an amazing job. Where they were only asked to do two <laughs> slides and they did four, four activities each, four things each. Mahmoud. Merci. Euh, ce qu'on a appris déjà de l'exercice à travers ces, les quatre axes qu'on a travaillé, euh, c'est que, bon, on a, on a senti que, que pour une AMP donnée, euh, on a toujours besoin d'un plus, de, de plus. On ne peut, peut jamais dire que c'est bon, qu'on qu est satisfait, mais, même si on fait beaucoup de choses. Mais euh, il se voit toujours qu'il y a un besoin. Effectivement, on a trouvé pour notre cas qu'il y, qu y avait des, il y avait des, des cas de, des cas d'échecs, si on peut dire entre parenthèses, mais qui ont été rattrapés, comme le cas du zonage qui a été fait au début, parce que le zonage tout au début du, pour le cas du parc de Hassina, ça a été ciblé vraiment pour des, des espèces données. On parlait du bon bizarre pêcheur, de la patelle. Et donc, du fait, le zonage qui a été utilisé, il a, il a, il a un peu contourné toute la, toute la, la côte, la côte littorale où il y avait ses habitats, mais pas nécessairement, euh, si on peut, si on peut, si je me permets de le dire, de, de tenir en compte un peu les zonages euh, là où il y a la pêche artisanale. Mais une chose qui a été rattrapée avec l'effort de, de, des partenaires, y compris le CARSP de notre côté, donc il y avait un suivi rapproché et un, un, un approfondissement de, de diagnostic et qui a sorti après avec des, des zonages, si on peut dire, un peu concertés et, et euh, mis en accord entre toutes les parties prenantes. Euh, une autre chose, c'est que euh, il y avait pas mal d'infrastructures qui, qui ont été faites au niveau du parc d'Alcima, euh, qui ciblaient beaucoup le, 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 le cas du suivi, de l'éducation, de la sensibilisation. On parlait beaucoup du cas de l'observatoire marin, euh, qui va jouer un rôle de suivi scientifique pour la partie marine, mais qui a aussi un, ro un rôle double de, 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 de la sensibilisation. Mais reste toujours le, le, le problème de, de, du personnel adéquat. Je crois que chaque air marine protégé, des fois, on peut avoir des subventions, des, des financements importants pour l'infrastructure. Mais il faut chercher les, les personnes euh, capacités pour, pour, pour gérer ces, ces centres, pour faire le suivi. Donc ça aussi, c'est un, un créneau auquel on doit penser. Merci. Ok, euh, alors j'ai une, une quatrième chose, si j'ose dire, c'est qu'on ne peut pas dissocier le capital euh, social du capital naturel. Il y a une relation win-win entre les deux. Donc euh, le capital naturel permet d'offrir de, 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 des matières premières, alors le capital social permet de valoriser cette matière première pour avoir des fonds pour pouvoir euh, financer les actions. Si vous commencez à regarder ça, il n'y a pas de MPA parfait. Vous pensez que vous avez the right zoning the first time round, you always end up finding that there's a better way to do things. So that, that's why also the approach of adaptive management is so important. And this idea of uh, looking into all these vulnerability assessments, the impact assessment, doing this, not over and over again, because you've got to manage the park, obviously, but at regular intervals, and making sure that this gets written into the work to do this gets written into the operational plan uh, so that each year or two years, whatever it is, whatever your procedure is, you will sit down with your team and think about what do we need to do. We should have a meeting with the fishermen to see how it's going with them. We should have a meeting with the tourist operators. We should have a meeting with everyone together and start to work out a bit more if everybody's happy, if there's something else we could be doing. And hopefully some of these exercises you'll be able to, able to use. Just a point from each of the other groups. Anybody, what, did you learn something uh, particular from, from the Palm Island Nature Reserve? Any thoughts there? <laughs> Oh, what, just one point, one point. Okay. It's a tight question. <laughs> so, um, for us it was like uh, very challenging because 
uh, as manager, we are thinking always about protection and conservation. So for us, uh, the questions that we ask about it and we discuss it between us, it is like evolving of livelihood. So yeah, we care about livelihood, but our idea is like to have protection, conservation, that's the point. So if we close the area, we should close it because we protect, not to let people come. So if they don't want to come, it's okay for us, we are, we are okay. This, this point, so it was difficult for us to think, but it is a good uh, way to, a new way to think because we are dealing with, um, uh, with the other part. So we are thinking, we are designing an MPA uh, so to think about valorization of what we have as resources and keep them, keep them on the hand of the livelihood, let's say. Yeah, but uh, it is challenging, so <laughs> not easy. <laughs> that's the point. Thank you. Yeah, th th that's very good, Ali, because uh, Ali and I, I had to challenge him on this. He said, but it's a marine protected area. We're protecting the biodiversity. Ah, you may be protecting the biodiversity, but it's no good if the local community isn't happy. So that's really what we're trying to work out, is how to really make the benefits show. Anything from, uh, can you, just a different point, just something very short. What did you learn? Uh, okay, for, for us, uh, we, um, we have a different issue. It's about uh, military uh, uh, there inside the uh, MBA. So it's uh, uh, difficult to make any, uh, you know, any uh, uh, activities inside the, uh, the MBA. So uh, we have to make uh, another opportunity for the locals, uh, just like uh, maybe use them as a, a guide uh, in uh, ranger in the MBA. Uh, uh, maybe some uh, uh, workshops uh, and uh, improve the uh, knowledge in the fishing in the uh, uh, work. Uh, that's it. Okay. I can add one thing. And uh, the Saloom MPA, they do a zonation just for the locals uh, to have a good livelihood outside the MPA so they can go fishing outside the MPA. Thank you. Yeah, I, I thought it's great that we've got such an unusual MPA as one of the examples. A, a military MPA is a really interesting set of conditions, but it throws up all these, all these different things. And I thought it was interesting. I haven't heard any other MPAs represented in the room mention this role that the local community can actually often get jobs inside an MPA as guides, rangers, uh, in quite a lot of places, that is a key benefit for local community if there's employment offered, offered by the MPA. So that's also something to think about for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think now we move to the, sorry, the pop quiz, just to get your adrenaline going. <laughs> um, the, the, pop, the, the, the pop quiz master is just uh, the pop quiz master is just coming. We need a roll of drums. I'm not giving any clues away. <laughs> No, everybody put their mobile phone away. Sit on your mobile. Turn the Wi-Fi off. Mobile phones away. <laughs> oh, maybe we don't have a question. <laughs> Is it going? There. There. Here it comes. Okay, are you ready? Bingo. Yeah. Let me see if I can manage to open it. <laughs> yes. This is just building up the suspense. <laughs> this also means that you have to answer very, very quickly before we have to leave the room. <laughs> this is all intentional. Uh, I, so I think you're going to have to give the answer. Yep. Yep. That's why I said that. Okay. So, can you read the question? I'll read it out. Okay, the MPA quiz. Which, 
What is the asset value in US dollars per year of the Mediterranean Sea? Quelle est la valeur d'actif? The value in US dollars. 5.7 million. 5.7 million. 4.5 million dollars. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Egypt. Yes, I think um, uh, 5.6 million. Billion. Which uh, 5.6 what? What? 5.7. 450 million. Billion. 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 Four, uh, billion. Four, five, zero billion. Four point five trillion. Anybody else? Go again. Uh, Four hundred fifty million dollars. <laughs> Six, six point five billion. <laughs> 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 Raise your hands. Five million dollars. Alex, someone has I will not answer. I will. I don't want to win. I'll give the opportunity for an because I know the answer. It is 92% of, let's say, coastal and services, 2% fisheries. There is like a 6% uh, services. And I have another number. So point, uh, 4.6 is for upside, and 4.50 is downside. So I have you a lot. So, I have a lot. You're right. Your numbers are right, but it's not a What do we do? <laughs> 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 Give two prizes. Two prizes. Yeah. Give, give that one to Ali, because he got something yesterday. It's a joke. Ah, but, but Ali did not win. Oh, I thought Ali was one of uh, No, that's for multiple. No, that's for, that's not. Oh, okay. It was really three in there for a group of three. For when three people answer. Okay, so this is a dance. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so nobody was right, <laughs> but uh, you want the number. Yes. And you want to trillion. Yes. So yeah. if you two, you are a good team. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you should share this. So, so you should share this. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Is Hawaii or? Yeah, Hawaii. Hawaii. It's Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you everyone.